This is part of the Book of Physics series on electromagnetism. This is part 2A of conformal mapping. This is part of the Book of Physics series on electromagnetism. This is part 2A of conformal mapping. In the last lecture, part 2, I explained how to find the potential outside of a very long conducting cylinder at potential V0 above an infinite ground conducting plane. That's essentially a two-dimensional problem. You can think of it as just a circle that's at potential V0 and a line that's grounded. And I wrote down the transformation function to convert this more complicated geometry to the simpler geometry of two concentric circles that are centered at the origin. And I pointed out that you need to appeal to symmetry to, in order to be able to write that transformation function down. In this brief lecture today, I'm going to explain how to use symmetry to solve problems like this one. So let's begin with what is meant by the term symmetry in this context. In the diagram on the left, the two points Z1 and Z2 are symmetric with respect to the contour defined by y equals x. Recall from geometry that two points are symmetric to a line if that line is a perpendicular bisector of the line that joins the two points. In addition, any circle that passes through the symmetric points Z1 and Z2 will also intersect the line perpendicularly. In the diagram on the right, the two points Z1 and Z2 are not symmetric with respect to the line defined by the equation y equals x. Bilinear transformations are symmetry preserved. State the theorem from complex analysis. Two points Z1 and Z2 are symmetric to a contour, which may be a line or a circle, if and only if their images are symmetric to the image of the contour. As an illustration of this theorem, we'll first look at a straight line that is mapped to a straight line. Take a look, see that the uh, two symmetry points to that straight line also map over to two symmetry points in the W plane. The transformation, w is equal to 10 divided by z plus 2 plus i2, maps a straight line defined by y equals x to the straight line defined by v is equal to minus u. We'll denote a symmetric point by a tilde. The images of the points z and z tilde, that is to say w and w tilde, are symmetric to the line defined by v is equal to minus u. Under a different bilinear transformation, the images of the two points would also be symmetric to the image of the line defined by y equals x. This is what is meant by the term symmetry preserving. Finding points that are symmetric to a straight line is a question of simple geometry. Now I'm going to find points that are symmetric to a circle. So let's suppose the circle is of radius r and it's located um, at point A. Remember, A is a complex quantity. Well, suppose that the original point is at alpha and therefore its symmetric point, alpha tilde, is going to be located on a ray that connects alpha with the center of the circle, which is located at point A. By virtue of the theorem, we know that if we map this circle over to an image, those two points, alpha and alpha tilde, are going to map over to points that are likewise symmetric with respect to the image. So let's suppose that we have a transformation that maps this circle over to the real axis. Now, granted, you could use, map this over to any straight line, um, another circle, but the point of this exercise is, is that we want to get alpha tilde in terms of alpha. Map this to the straight line, therefore, the images of those two points, alpha and alpha tilde, are likewise going to be symmetric with respect to the contour. So, alpha and alpha tilde are symmetric with respect to the circle in the z plane. Uh, the images of those two points, alpha and alpha tilde, are symmetric with respect to the image of the circle. So, two points are symmetric with respect to the real axis. Basically, uh, that means that this um, two points are complex conjugates of each other. So, in other words, if this is at 3 plus i2, then the symmetric point will be at 3 minus i2. Let me begin by writing down a transformation that maps this circle over to the real axis. Let me 
transformation um, is Z minus ZA capital A times ZB minus ZC all over Z minus ZC times ZB minus ZA. Point A capital A is located at A minus R. CD is located at A plus IR. ZC is located at A plus R. A minus R in the numerator and over Z minus A plus R in the denominator. And these two other factors, we have R times I minus 1 in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have R times I plus 1. R's cancel out. And if you do math here, this is just basically equal to I. side we have I times alpha tilde minus A minus R and the denominator is alpha tilde minus A plus R. On the right hand side we take the complex conjugate of uh, the energy of the point alpha so it'll be minus I. We have alpha complex conjugate when we use an asterisk to indicate complex uh, something's complex conjugate minus A star minus R all over A star minus um, A star plus R.
So all I've done is multiply both through, sides through by the denominators and then multiply everything out. And I have to leave off some of the algebraic steps, but what you'll find is alpha tilde is equal to r squared over alpha star minus a star plus a. And that's how you determine the location of the symmetric point alpha tilde, knowing, uh, given rather, I should say, the original point alpha, and uh, making use of the theorem that the images must be symmetric with respect to the uh, image of the contour. So that's again alpha tilde is equal to r squared over alpha. Uh, complex conjugate of alpha minus complex conjugate of alpha of A plus A. The contour is a circle described by the equation absolute value of z plus 2 minus i is equal to 1. We select the point x is equal to minus 1.75, y is equal to 1.25, and calculate the symmetric point to be at x equals 0, y equals 3. The dashed line encircles the path through both symmetric points illustrate that the dashed line and dashed circles intersect the contour perpendicularly. The transformation w is equal to 1 plus i times z plus 2 all over z plus 1 minus i maps the circle to the real axis. The symmetric points z and z tilde map to x is equal to 1.8, y is equal to minus 1.4, and x is equal to 1.8, y is equal to 1.4, which are symmetric to the real axis. This brings us back to the original problem of a circle at potential v naught above a line that is grounded. The transformation must map both circle and line to two concentric circles. We'll call the pole of the transformation function, which we don't know yet, zp. We'll make some observations about where the pole must lie. Since the center of the circle lies on the imaginary axis, the pole must also lie on the imaginary axis. Also, points that are symmetric with respect to the real axis are complex conjugates of each other. We can map the circle and line to two concentric circles by setting the symmetric point zp tilde to the complex conjugate of zp. Then the two points zp and zp tilde will be symmetric with respect to both the circle and the line. Although the two circles are concentric, they are not centered at the origin. The transformation z minus zp tilde all over z minus zp maps the circle and line to two concentric circles centered at the origin. The symmetric point ZP maps to the symmetric point WP, which is located at the origin, and ZP maps to infinity because it is the pole of the transformation function. The equation for determining uh, symmetric point alpha tilde is equal to r squared, where r is the radius of the circle, all over complex conjugate of alpha, the location of the original point minus complex conjugate of A, which is the location of the circle, or rather the center of the circle, plus A. Now, taking this back to the problem, uh, again, the circle represents a very long conducting cylinder, and the line represents the infinite ground conducting plane. This circle is described by the equation absolute value z minus 5i is equal to 4. The radius of the circle, therefore, is equal to 4, and the center of the circle is equal to 5i. The difficulty here is that you need to find the pole ZP such that both uh, the circle and the straight line map over to two circles and two circles that are concentric. 
So the pole is located somewhere down here. It's uh, will de denote the symmetric counterpart to this pole by ZP tilde. Okay, so ZP, ZP tilde are symmetric to the circle. But they also need to be able to, uh, they also need to be symmetric to the straight line as well in order for both uh, the circle and the line to map over to concentric circles. So the only way that can happen is if ZP tilde is equal to the complex conjugate of ZP. Remember ZP and it's, or any point along, its, say, the imaginary axis is going to have a symmetric point that's equal to uh, the complex conjugate. So with that, I can solve this equation for ZP. conjugate of Zp squared plus I5 complex conjugate of Zp is equal to 16 plus I5 complex conjugate of Zp minus 25. So these terms cancel out and you're left with the complex conjugate of Zp squared is equal to minus 9 or Zp complex conjugate is equal to plus or minus 3i. So therefore, uh, the pole we choose to be at minus 3i. And that's how you get the denominator uh, for this transformation. However, as uh, the figure showed, if you were just to use 1 over z plus 3i, you'd wind up with a two concentric circles whose center is not at the origin. And you want to make this problem so that you can write down the solution immediately. So as it turns out, uh, we can map this symmetric point over to the origin. We do that by z minus zp tilde, so that'll just be z minus 3i. And instead of mapping this circle, the straight line, over to concentric circles that are below the origin, this transformation will map them to two circles that are centered at the origin. And then, of course, you can write down the solution immediately between uh, the inner circle that is at potential V0 and the outer circle, which is grounded. So that's how you use symmetry principles to derive uh, the transformation function, which maps this more difficult geometry, into a simpler geometry where you can write down the solution immediately. Okay? And this concludes part 2a of conformal mapping. Go to www.bogophysics.com for more resources.